Tracy Letts is both a Tony Award winning actor and a Pulitzer Prize and Tony winning playwright. Now his 2003 play Man from Nebraska is receiving its New York premiere at Second Stage. We're here at the theater to talk to the playwright about revisiting this earlier work. So here we are on the set of Man from Nebraska. Mm -hmm. How does it feel for you to revisit a work that you wrote over a dozen years ago? It's been really interesting. I, I, I've never done this before. I guess I've just gotten to the age where some of the work starts to get revived. Uh, there's a big difference in being 36 and being 51. Uh, and uh, okay. to, to go back into the mindset that created this play has been uh, really interesting. Do you remember what the germinal idea was for Man from Nebraska? I do, though I can't tell you how I got there. I, I was in a cafeteria in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, I really don't know why I was there. Uh, tra driving through, but there was a couple in that cafeteria, an older married couple, eating their meal and not speaking to each other at all for the entirety of their meal. They were very comfortable. It was a comfortable silence. Mm -hmm. And it got me thinking, just asking the question, does everyone at some point in their lives, do we all ask the big questions? Do we all have that moment where we look up and say, why am I here? What am I doing here? And so I thought, what if you put those questions in the mind of a person who seems least likely to have those questions? And that was, that was really the jumping off point. This play feels a little bit like a departure from your earlier work with Killer Joe and Bug. It's more cinematic in the sense that there are a lot of scenes, almost 30 scenes. Um, is it true that this play was inspired by you seeing what you call a bad play? You don't have to put quotation marks around it. <laughs> it was a bad play. It, and it is true. It was a play that had a lot of different scenes, jumped around from location to location. And my first two plays had, were small plays, unit sets, small casts. And I remember getting very angry at this bad play, thinking, well, that's easy. Anybody can do that, right? Write a play that jumps around from scene to scene. And I was complaining about it on my way out of the theater with a, a friend I had seen the show with. And the friend said, gee, I don't know. Sometimes I like those plays. And it was a very... So maybe that wasn't the reason it was bad. Exactly. It, uh, the form doesn't make something bad. The writing makes something bad. So I decided to try my hand at that, too. And uh, so... Man from Nebraska is very different from those plays in the, that cinematic sense that, as you call it, uh, there are 29 scenes, a variety of locations, a challenge for any director to stage. I was thinking that Reed, Bernie, and Annette O'Toole could be a kind of American Gothic. We've, we said that more than once, oh, in yeah. fact, while they were standing on this stage. Uh, Cromer and I would elbow each other and say, it looks like American Gothic. No, it's, they're, they're, a, they're a great... Uh, they're a great representation of a Midwestern couple, though I think Reed's from Delaware and Annette's from Houston originally, but yeah. You said that one of your obsessions, for lack of a better word, is how people express themselves. And some of your characters and some of your other plays were not very expressive. One, one of the things that was really delightful about this play is the jump to London and these sort of hyper-articulate characters. Right. Did you have fun letting loose? Yeah, a lot of fun uh, and a real challenge because the voices in Nebraska, in Man from Nebraska, are so different uh, from, the, from the Midwestern voices to the London counterculture voices. There, there are a lot of different uh, characters. They run a real gamut in this play, and so to try to find those different voices was a real challenge. But yeah, I had a lot of fun with it. You know, one of the, one of the things that happens to Ken over the course of the play is that he begins to discover his own language. His own language starts to emerge from, from him. A guy, you know, there's a, there's a quote from Grapes of Wrath. Uh, uh, Ma Jode says, uh, our people, we take a pride in holding in. A and so for a guy like Ken, uh, who, who takes a pride in holding in to suddenly find himself uh, with, with a, a new means of expression. Uh, yeah, that's very exciting. Uh, it's a, one of the challenges you, you set out for yourself as a, as a playwright. Well, Will Eno says we, we solve problems we make for ourselves. That that's in some ways the, the job of a playwright. Sure, you have to get them up the tree and then you have to get them yeah. back down somehow. <laughs> right. Do you think that uh, your work as an actor informs your writing 
and vice versa. Can you just talk a little bit about that? I hope it does. I, I sure hope it does. I mean, some of it is just about paying attention. Uh, some of it is just about being in rehearsal rooms my entire life. You try to find out uh, just the best way to tell a story. Also, I know as an actor, the stuff that's fun to say, the stuff that's fun to do, the, the, the red meat that uh, actors absolutely love doing. If you provide that for actors, man, they'll, they'll, they'll crawl through glass for you. And being an actor, of course, you get to know how an audience responds to things, perhaps more than just a writer in a room. It's very interesting for me because you are both an actor and a, a writer, I would say equally. You have two tracks in your mind somehow, and you've never been in any of your plays, which I feel like a lot of um, actors become playwrights because they want to write a juicy part for themselves. Yeah, that's just never I been my... It's never been my interest. Laurie Metcalf said that to me recently. She said, man, if I were a playwright, I'd just write myself the juiciest role. But that's because she's, Laurie's a great actress and wants great roles to play. I just never, I just don't think I'd be as good at either job if I tried to do them both at the same time. I, I, I know I wouldn't. I know I would be, as an actor, I would be self-conscious about uh, say, saying these lines <laughs> that I wrote. I, I know I would feel that way. So. For me, it's just always made more sense to, to keep them separate. Both of your parents had two careers each. Your mother was, they were both professors. Mm -hmm. And then your father, of course, was an actor, we all know from when he was on Broadway in August right. Osage County. And your mother is a best-selling author, was a best-selling author. Do you think that their second careers you somehow made into your dual career? Uh, yeah, I mean, clearly in some way that that's what happened. You know, we were a creative family. I, I, there was always music on the stereo, uh, movies on the television, uh, books, books, stacks and stacks of books. Uh, my my parents put a put a real premium on uh, creativity, storytelling. Uh, I th <laughs> I think they were so eager for uh, my brother and I to, uh, to, to have interesting lives. I think they thought that was a, I think they set that out for themselves as a, as a, as a real goal. And uh, Well, they I, certainly succeeded. Uh, well, you know, I, I think for them, if I had decided to go into banking, they would have been just heartbroken. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tracy. Thanks. It was great to talk to you. Nice to talk to you. Go see Man from Nebraska, now through March 12th at Second Stage. Thanks.